Buying a new rear shock for your full suspension mountain bike is not as simple as buying a new set of forks. You cannot just match or buy a certain travel length in a rear shock. They operate very differently. So you will need to know certain specs and measurements that are specific to your frame. And you might even need to buy some additional mountain hardware and bushings as well. But don't worry, it seems complicated, but it's simple when you know, and I'm gonna go through all of that today. If you want to replace or upgrade your rear shock, it's not as simple as going out and buying the right travel length like you do with forks. So for example, if you had 120 mil rear suspension, you can't just go out and buy 120 mil shock. It doesn't work like that. The reason why is because the travel in the rear wheel is governed by the linkage design of your bike, not by the shock itself. So the rear wheel may move 120 mils but the shock will only actually move say 50 mils and they may even move in a different leverage ratio as it goes through the travel so what you need to know is the certain measurements and fitments and what sort of shock you can actually get in your frame so if you're going to upgrade let's first talk about coil versus air two fundamental categories for rear shocks and that is air and coil and that just describes the physical way that the shock suspends itself so it could be with a physical coil and you'll see that there's a coil on the outside of the shock or it could be air like I've got here and that's the air within the can itself now a coil is said to be more supple initially. It's also said to be more linear. So it compresses at the same rate as it goes through its travel. Whereas air is conversely more progressive. And what we mean by that is as the air starts to compress, it gets firmer through the travel. So air is quite good when it comes to controlling bottom out. It's also quite light. So you often see air on light trail bikes or XC and downcountry bikes like I've got here. Also, the benefit of air is that it's more adjustable on the fly because it's controlled by just adding or removing air in order to get your correct sag and your weight measurements reflective of your body weight. Whereas with coil, you will have to physically remove the shock and physically remove the spring in order to get the right spring rate for your body weight. So it can be a little bit more faffy, it can be a little bit more expensive as well. Also, there are compatibility issues when it comes to air and coil. Although it can be personal preference on what you choose, your frame may not be compatible with one or the other. So for example, as we know, coil can be quite linear and this might not be compatible with how your rear suspension works. It may be too linear to be paired with perhaps a rear suspension that is also linear. And you will find in your manual, it will say whether your frame is compatible with air or coil, or if it needs to have some kind of progressivity to match your rear suspension. So when you buy a new shock, if you're just replacing it for like for like, it's not as simple as just buying the same model because each model will come in a different size to fit different frames. And what you will need is two measurements. You'll need the eye to eye length and you will need the stroke length. The eye to eye is the measurement of that shock from the eyelet to eyelet. So that is the center of the hole to the other center of the hole and the shock needs to be fully extended. Now this can be really tricky to measure. The best thing to do with all measurements actually is to try and find the technical specs online for your frame or the manual for your frame. And they will almost certainly have the eye to eye and the stroke length required for your frame in there. A digital caliper is probably the most accurate way to measure your bike uh, rather than a ruler, but you can do it with a ruler or a measuring tape. Uh, the problem with some frames, as you can see here, is that eyelets might be oriented in different ways and you might not be able to do it on the bike. So if you do need to measure your shock, then you might have to remove it. <laughs> 
The second measurement you need is the stroke length, and this is how much movement your rear shock has from fully extended to fully compressed. So you might have to let all the air out of your shock in order to figure out where fully compressed is. So on my shock, often it's around about the line for the Kashima writing here, but you are gonna have to figure that out on your own shock. Now, it might be better to take this out of the frame and measure it fully extended and then measure it fully compressed. And that difference should give you the stroke length. Uh, you can actually do this with the eyelet measurements as well. If you were able to measure the eyelets from one end to the other when it's fully extended and then you let all of the air out and measure those eyelets again, the difference between those numbers is how much stroke your shock has. So just to reiterate those two numbers, it sounds all complicated, but it's much easier to go and find the technical specs for your frame and it should be listed. Sometimes they separate the numbers in a chart and sometimes they put them together. So it might say 190 by 50, for example, and that is the eye to eye length and then the stroke length. Uh, but usually the eye to eye is the bigger number anyway. A quick word on understroking and overstroking your bike. So that effectively means getting a different stroke measurement to what is recommended for your frame in order to try and change the travel length. Now, it's not always that simple. Uh, complicated linkage systems means that the rate at which your rear wheel moves uh, might be slightly different to the rate at which your shock is compressed and your frame will be designed for a particular stroke length in mind. And if you change that, you might change the rate at which the wheel moves. You might have linkages bashed together. You might even have the wheel contact the frame because it's not designed for that stroke. Now there are frames out there that do allow it, but they are explicit at what you can run. So for example, Yeti SB130, they have a 52.5 mil shock and they do provide a lunch ride, which means you can have a 55 mil stroke shock, but they have tested this and they allow you to do it and they're explicit with it. If your frame does not, then it won't be warranted if you change it. And when you buy your new shock, it won't come with any mounting hardware. So that's the hardware required to mount the shock to your frame. And some frames require it, some frames don't. So for example, mine here, I don't need any bushings uh, in the lower part no mounting hardware there, but I do require a bushing in the top to be mounted to the shock so that it goes in the frame. Now, usually your manual or your technical specs of your frame will tell you what bushings or what mounting hardware you require. And there's a couple of measurements that you'll need to know uh, to get the correct bushing. So you will need to know the size of the hole that it's going into in your shock. Uh, often this is about 15 mil, but do check. And then you'll need to know the length or the longer part of the bushing. So this could be 24 mil, for example. And you'll also need to know the diameter of the hole in which the bolt goes through. So that could be eight mil, for example. Now, usually in your manual, you'll see something like 24 by eight, and that will be 24, the length of the bushing by eight, which is the hole in which the bolt goes through. So it's an eight mil bolt. And the tricky thing about mounting hardware or bushings in the shocks is that you, even if you're swapping light from light from the frame, you can often keep the uh, bushing from the old shock, but you will need a specific tool to pop it out and to press it back into your new shock. So either buy your shock and pay for the service in a local bike shop if you don't want to buy the tool, or maybe even buy the shock from the shop itself so that they can help you get the right bushing and to put it in as well. If you're looking at your manual and you found the measurements for the bushings that you require, perhaps the length and the bolt diameter, you might see something else like 
15 mil open eye or open-ended eye or something like that and that just means that one side or maybe even both don't require any bushings at all you'll probably have a proprietary bolt like i do for my lux here that fits into the 15 mil uh, and that's because well actually that's one standard we can actually call a standard in sharks is that they're almost always 15 mil in diameter here if you have a trunnion mounted shock that means that there's an eyelet going through the main air can itself now often this means that there's two bolts that go in either side of the shock itself and this means that you'll have proprietary bolts that came with your frame to mount that shock and you probably don't need any bushings uh, around the top part of that shock you may or may not need mountain hardware or bushings at the other end you can just check that by removing and having a look at the shock or checking the manual and the specs on your frame. Now another few things to consider is whether you want a lockout, what your orientation is and if you want a piggyback on your bike or if you've got one already. So if your shock has an extra reservoir that's called a piggyback and it's an extra reservoir of oil which helps give more oil volume which can control temperature changes for more aggressive riders or for long descents. Now if you have a piggyback already you can switch to an inline now this is an inline because it doesn't have a piggyback but if you have an inline shock right now and you want to switch to a piggyback you do need to check whether your frame can actually take that some frames say that they can't take piggybacks uh, you want to check to see if that extra reservoir can actually fit somewhere in your frame now let's talk about orientation. So that piggyback can sometimes move in different directions. It can be switched round and generally there shouldn't be any rule on which way round your shock goes. There might be some specs in your frame technical specs on what orientation the shock should be, but otherwise it's just personal preference and making sure that there's clearance for things like water bottles in your frame. Another thing to consider is your lockout. So on my Canyon Lux, I do have internal routing for a lockout. So if I wanted to keep that, then I'd need to buy a shock with the lockout mechanism. If you don't want that, then you don't need to think about that. But you do need to consider what's happening with the frame. You can't just put a lockout on there if your frame doesn't have the routing for that, uh, unless you're happy with the lockout being routed externally. Now some frames have eyelets that face in the same direction and some have eyelets that maybe go up or sideways and have different orientations. But don't worry, this isn't something you need to consider when you're buying your shock because the shaft of that shock can actually rotate to meet the correct position of your linkages and your mounting. Whew, that's a lot of information to go through and we haven't even talked about different models or performance benefits or even the dials but we have done a lot of suspension videos out there so if you want to watch those to get an idea of the sort of adjustments you can make to a shock and the differences that that makes then go and watch those um, and also let's just be clear that usually all of these measurements, although it all seems complicated, should be in your manual. These days, even old bikes have the technical specs online and it's always best to check that. Uh, and generally don't listen to Dave on Forum X who's telling you that he changed his stroke length and it was much better because really you need to be sticking to what is recommended. And last, but by no means least, when you put your shock back in your frame, make sure you're greasing those bolts and make sure you're talking up to the specs. So usually the torque number is written on the bolts or on your frame somewhere, or at least it will be in that manual again. Anyway, best of luck choosing your new shock uh, and do check out our other videos that tell you how to measure sag properly and get that suspension set up correctly. Thanks for watching.